Good afternoon and a warm welcome to the launch of the easel, the Lancet Commission on Protecting the Next Generation of Europeans Against Liver Disease Complication and Premature Mortality. I'm Thomas Burke. I'm the Secretary General of the European Association for the Study of the Liver. Easel and the Lancet, the most prestigious medical journal in Europe, commissioned its work which we will talk about today in 2018. And it was done with the idea to describe the current trend of liver disease in Europe with an outlook for the future. So after three years of investigation and analysis, we are delighted to finally be here to share with you the key findings and recommendations from the commission's analysis. So joining me today and as co-chair, um, of this launch event is Professor Patricia Bura. Professor Bura is co-chair of the Easel Lancet Commission and head of the Department of Gastroenterology at the University of Padova in Italy. Welcome, Patricia. Great to see you. Great that you are here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Berger. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here on behalf of uh, the other two chairs. Professor Manns and Professor uh, uh, Tom Carson. I should say that it was a great experience, the collaboration with Lansen, and, and we'd like really to, to, to thank Richard Orton and uh, uh, Sabine Kleiner. She has been fantastic together. And uh, this is really a privilege, uh, and I'm talking on behalf of Michael Manns and Tom Carson too, uh, to have this opportunity. So thank you to Isol and thank you to uh, to, to Lancet. So uh, just, just to say that uh, the priority, our priority as a commission was really to identify those barriers to the improvement of liver health and uh, surely identify the necessary solutions. So thank you so much and I leave uh, uh, the word to you, Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. And now it gives me really a great pleasure and privilege to introduce the editor-in-chief of The Lancet, Professor Richard Horton. Richard, please over to you. Well, thanks so much. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Richard Horton from The Lancet. You know, it was around a decade ago that I was first approached by the late Roger Williams, uh, who you will all know his name, um, and many of you will know him, will have known him well in person. Uh, he'd done so much to establish the specialty of hepatology in the United Kingdom. And he asked me to initiate a Lancet Commission on liver disease in the UK. And it's great to see Nick Sharon on this uh, call. Uh, Nick played such a pivotal part in that work. Why liver disease? Um, and the answer of course was because although liver medicine in the United Kingdom at that time had seen the expansion of specialist health services, a robust transplant program, a strong research base, the extraordinary and deeply disappointing fact was that mortality from liver disease was increasing, not decreasing. And that meant that uh, we had to accept that the approach pursued by the hepatology community had, sad to say, not succeeded, indeed had failed. It was a time to pause, to rethink, and to devise a different strategy. And that strategy was one based on prevention, identifying the key causes of serious liver disease, alcohol use, obesity, untreated viral hepatitis, a multidisciplinary collaboration across public health, primary care, and other medical specialties, such as, and in particular, child and adolescent health, forging a new alliance with patient-led organizations for advocacy and policy making, a stronger political engagement to address the social determinants of liver disease, and indeed to scale up specialist care services, rec recognizing that liver disease was an underestimated contributor to the use of health services. And across all these domains, the lesson that we learned was that we had to fight stigma and discrimination because liver disease affects particularly disadvantaged and marginalized groups in our societies, populations that are too easily ignored and dismissed, and yet whose needs were being 
systematically neglected. Now we published annual reports over that decade to drive greater attention to liver disease, but we also learned an important lesson, one that I'm very sad to say that Roger Williams didn't live long enough to see fully. And that lesson was that if we are truly to address the causes of the liver disease crisis, and that's what it is, a crisis facing our societies, we had to go beyond a single country. And the reason for that is very obvious, that the determinants of liver disease are transnational. And so the success of any comprehensive plan to address the demand, the needs of patients and the public uh, who are living with liver disease or who are at risk of liver disease means that we need a transnational approach. The idea that a single country such as the United Kingdom or any other country in Europe could succeed only as a single country living in splendid isolation from its neighbours was a serious mistake. And that is why I am so pleased today to see the publication of this Europe-wide manifesto, for that's what it is, a manifesto to tackle and defeat the growing threat uh, to the health of European citizens. I'd like to really thank Tom Carson for initially re reaching out to me, to the co-chairs, Tom, Patricia, Burrow, Michael Manns, the working group chairs, and of course, to our principal partners, EASL. I remember as a young clinician going to EASL meetings, and it's wonderful to come full circle um, and be a, a partner with EASL once again. Because when countries work together as equal partners, committed to a common strategy, and an endeavor, then the sum of their commitments and actions will be much greater than their individual parts. And it really is a remarkable collaboration. We have all parts of Europe, four corners of Europe represented here. Um, and let me just tell you the countries that are involved. Norway, the United Kingdom, Israel, France, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Germany, Finland, Sweden, Belgium, Croatia, Poland, Bulgaria, Greece, and Portugal. And two honorary members of, the, of Europe, the United States and Australia, all participated um, as well. I'd like to thank my colleague, Sabina Kleiner, who's actually uh, going to be speaking to you from Munich, where we have our European office that she leads. If I may say, this commission really shows the strength of medicine and medical science, public health, primary care and patient voices across the European continent. It really shows what we can achieve when we work together with a common objective. Our task now after this webinar is going to be to turn that spirit of extraordinary collaboration into a program of action. And so let me say very clearly that at The Lancet, we look forward to that continuing partnership with EASL, with all of the authors of this report, report to really being, build a strong movement across the continent. So thank you so much for letting me make some opening remarks. All power to you um, and let's proceed. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think in the name of EASL, um, I couldn't and we couldn't agree more. I think you're fully right. It's a manifesto. We are certainly aware of the need for a really a proper afterlife. And I also couldn't agree more that it's so important that we stay together and work together over the borders. And um, so thank you very much for your very important and kind words. And I would like to hand over to Patricia. Yes, thank you. And uh, it's really a great pleasure for me to give, uh, to open this keynote statement on EU health policy by the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. Dear Mr. Horton, lieber Herr Professor Manz, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to speak to you. The Lancet is one of the world's oldest and most respected medical journals. As a medical doctor by training, I know that the topic is very important. The European Association for the Study of the Liver has been dedicated to countering liver disease for over 50 years. It is a major health threat in Europe, 
but it is often diagnosed too late. Worldwide, it is on the rise. So your task force is both timely and urgent. We have made significant progress in the treatment of liver disease. This was internationally recognized when in 2020, three of your colleagues were awarded the Nobel Prize for their discovery of the hepatitis C virus. It's a great achievement that we have now oral drugs available and for the first time, a chronic viral infection in man has become curable, hepatitis C. And the vaccine against hepatitis B is able to prevent liver cancer. These are examples that show that modern science can deliver incredible results. And yet, there is still suffering. Each year, almost 300,000 people in Europe die prematurely due to problems of the liver. Many of them could have lived longer and healthier lives. Because today, in most European countries, there is good access to secondary care. And in most cases, liver disease can be prevented. Prevention is the best cure that we have. So together, we need to raise more awareness of the preventable and treatable nature of many chronic illnesses. This also means removing stigma from issues like alcoholism. Alcoholism is itself an illness where people need social support. But alcoholism is behind most cases of liver disease. And unhealthy diet is a major cause of liver disease too. This is well known to us. But who else is aware of this? According to studies in Europe, over 1 million cases of chronic disease could be avoided each year with just 20% less calories in our diet. So in September this year, the Commission launched its Healthy Lifestyle for All campaign. It promotes healthy school environments. And we all know that with such very concrete actions, we can make a huge difference on the ground. But we also know that even though Europe is one of the most developed regions in the world, there are still huge differences in access to preventive care and diagnostics. And this is why the EU Health Programme and Horizon 2020 invested over 50 million euros in hepatitis prevention since 2015. We have focused in particular on the communities most at risk because science tells us that illnesses like viral hepatitis pose a disproportionate risk to disadvantaged groups in our societies. And this is why it is so important that we join efforts through European solidarity to reach all communities and regions of our European Union. Ladies and gentlemen, the transformative shift towards preventive care requires all hands on deck. I am very impressed by your holistic approach. The composition of your task force reflects the diversity needed. You include patients, nurses and medical professionals trained in obesity and diabetes, all the way to addiction and infectious diseases. It's the same approach that we have taken with Europe's Beating Cancer Plan and our mission on cancer. I am glad that your association has already joined the stakeholder contact group. Dear colleagues, not every disease is preventable, but where we can help save lives and reduce suffering, we must do our utmost. This is what patients expect, and that is also what European citizens expect from politics. It's a noble task to address chronic illnesses. I want to thank you for your tireless efforts and your commitment. You can always count on the European Commission to stand by your side 
And now I wish you a very successful meeting. Thank you for your attention. I think no. if I may just summarize, uh, it was a really, you all understand it was a unique opportunity that we had to have the president of the European Commission supporting uh, the ESO Lancet uh, Libre Commission. So there was really a, a unique opportunity. And uh, as you have heard, she really summarized in a perfect way all the recommendations that uh, the Commission uh, uh, prepared and reported in the paper. So that was uh, a great, really, uh, event. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Patricia, and a special thank, of course, to the to the president of the EU Commission, Dr. Ursula von der Leyen. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, and the next speaker is Professor Michael Manns, and he is president of the Hanover Medical School, and he is and was a co-chair of the ESL Lancet Commission. So Professor Manns will give you an overview on the ESL Lancet Commission. Please, Michael, over to you. Thank you. Wait a minute. Yes. Wait a minute. Okay. Yes, thank you very, very much for the kind introduction. And it's really a pleasure to give you an overview of this uh, Manifesto, as Richard uh, Orton called it, the ESA Lancet Liver Commission protecting the next generation of Europeans against liver disease complications and premature mortality. And you see the list of authors is numerous, uh, more than 50 authors we have, because this has been a interdisciplinary approach. Liver doctors, hepatologists, researchers, clinicians, but also primary care physicians, specialists of other specialties like diabetes specialists, but also patient representatives and nurses. We tried to summarize the whole problem, the crisis, as Richard Corton called it. Uh, we have some very good examples uh, in liver diseases where we made significant progress and significantly contributed to translational research and progress in modern medicine. This on the left side is one example. Uh, in 1989, the hepatitis C virus was discovered. And over the following years, therapies were developed. We have not a vaccine yet, but we can cure hepatitis C in almost every patient by drugs, by pills. And this, I think, is a masterpiece of translational research, which is changing the landscape, not only of liver research, and this discovery, as the EU President Ursula von der Leyen told us, was awarded last year by the Nobel Prize to three colleagues of us. On the right side, you see a figure from a publication of Dr. Carlson and Dr. Tucker from the Journal of Hepatology, showing that for the success in hepatitis C research, research is declining in hepatitis C, while other areas are growing, one example, is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but also you can see that liver cancer, HCC, is increasing. It's among the most increasing cancers in the world and among the top cancers leading to death. We have also in the multidisciplinary commission uh, working groups, nine working groups, one dealing with disease burden and prevention, including policy, and number two working group, which is very important, is dealing with stigma from liver disease, including human rights and the patient's voice. We have a working group on primary and community care, including testing and access to care pathways. We have a working group dealing with educational frameworks and care models to support new standards in tackling liver disease. And then we have five reference groups dealing with particular liver diseases, including fatty liver disease, viral liver disease, rare diseases, including pediatrics, liver oncology, and end-stage decompensated liver disease. Here, I show you a very important cartoon and example. Liver-related mortality is increasing and affects young Europeans. On the right side, you see liver disease is a leading cause of years of working life loss and the age distribution of deaths in Europe due to alcohol-related liver disease 
shows that patients are affected in their working lives in the 40s and 50s. And on the left side, you see on the right, the red line, that years of working life lost is second only to ischemic heart disease. Therefore, we call for a paradigm shift in tackling liver disease. Treatment aimed too much on end-stage liver disease and liver cancers, which is expensive, including secondary care, hospitalization, and very costly uh, procedures like liver transplantation. We have overlooked in the past too often reversible stages of liver disease. And this includes rare liver diseases, including pediatrics, viral hepatitis B, C, D, and A and E, and also alcohol and obesity-induced liver disease. Therefore, we call for a paradigm sh shift. We want shifting focus towards early disease stages and prevention and would have a greater effect on liver-related mortality. And this not only includes food reformulation, taxation, pricing regulations, it in particular also includes that we bring the modern medicine that is available in treatment and prevention to our patients, like hepatitis C, but also hepatitis B, hepatitis D, Delta, and using the vaccines, hepatitis B, but also hepatitis A. Then personalized therapies. One example is personalized therapy in liver cancer, where in recent years, numerous drugs are, have been developed and have been approved. The recommendations are targeting either primary health care providers or politicians. We have five recommendations for healthcare providers. Number one, implementation of standardized and simplified liver blood tests for early detection and prompt care. Number two, utilization of opportunities created by the new hepatitis B and C drugs, as well as the vaccines available B and A to achieve viral elimination in Europe. We have to increase awareness and provide financial incentives for primary care peers and professionals. In non-viral liver diseases, we must classify along with other non-communicable diseases to engage appropriate care models. And number five, all forms and sources of stigma towards people at risk of or with liver disease must be opposed. Relevant changes to the medical nomenclature should come first. And recommendations for policymakers are as follows. Public disclosure of prices of antiviral drugs throughout Europe would reinforce the WHO World Health Assembly resolution to improve fairness of market price. Then European governments must introduce uniform policies to reduce the harmful use of alcohol. We ask for a complete social and digital media ban on marketing of alcohol and ultra-processed high-fat and high-sugar foods targeted to children. Number nine, promote industry-led food reformulation and minimization of social inequities by subsidizing healthy foods. And finally, EU and European governments should prioritize the harmonization of critical forms of public health interventions and health-related policies across Europe. Towards the end, I want to make the case for Europe and ask for a uniform implementation of our recommendations in the name of my co-chairs, in the name of ESEL and all the commissioners and the Lancet. The liver is a window to the 21st century health of the European population. Therefore, read the Commission report, Easel Lancet Liver Commission, published today. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael, uh, for this impressive overview. I would like to remind our audience that you can ask questions via the Q&A button, so please feel free whenever you have any idea or question to, um, to send it to us. We will have a Q&A session after our panel discussion later on during this meeting. So hand over to you, Patricia. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Thomas.
It's a real pleasure to invite Nick Sharon, and she will, was one of the commissioners. Well, so well known, so it, it really doesn't need to have any, any further introduction, and will talk to us about the burden of liberty disease in Europe. Nick. Thanks, Patricia, and, and huge thanks to Richard uh, and the Lancet and, and Easel for allowing us to do this work. Um, I started my career with Roger Williams. He gave me my first job in liver disease and I've ended my career with him as well. He gave me my last job in liver disease and, uh, and I really miss him. Um, liver disease is, is really very straightforward. The main risk factors are alcohol. The majority of liver disease in Europe is caused by alcohol, obesity and viral hepatitis. But there are only really two uh, common disease processes. The first one is that of scarring or progressive fibrosis, which leads to cirrhosis. And the second is carcinogenesis, which leads to primary liver cancer. And irrespective of the cause of liver disease, they all go down this common pathway through these two disease processes. If you look at what's happened to mortality from liver disease, this is standardized death rates, you can identify different trends. On the left hand side here, we have countries with, a, with a, a stable and low level of liver mortality. These are countries like Scandinavia and the Netherlands. Uh, by and large, they have strong and effective alcohol control policies, and that's the key divider. You have countries like the Mediterranean countries, which used to have very high levels of liver disease, and liver disease mortality has fallen by four or five fold in some cases, directly related the reductions in the consumption of cheap wine. Amazingly, the wine industry has shifted to quality and the value of the wine industry has increased, not decreased. Win-win. You have countries with a very variable trajectory. Uh, outlined here is Hungary. You have increasing liver mortality as Hungary became more prosperous and then decreasing liver mortality as it became more health aware and people realised that they couldn't turn up to work drunk. Uh, you have countries, and the UK is an unfortunate example, where liver disease is increasing. And in the UK, it is still increasing. To this day, it is still increasing, and that is being driven directly by government policy, which is geared more towards the alcohol industry than to liver patients. And then finally, you have countries with very high levels of liver mortality, and I've identified uh, Romania here as the example. This is modelling done for us uh, in association with the Commission by the OECD. We're very grateful to them. And you can see here that the vast majority of deaths from liver disease are due to alcohol or obesity or indeed both. There's a, there's a marked overlap between the two and they're synergistic. Obesity doubles the liver toxicity of alcohol. Two bottles of wine becomes four bottles of wine if you're obese. There is no proven drug therapy that reduces mortality from either of these conditions at the present time. And certainly in alcohol, there's very little activity by big pharma in this area due to the stigma associated with, with uh, liver patients. This has already been mentioned, but uh, liver disease kills people at a young age. If you walk onto a liver ward, you will see people in their 40s, and 50s. If you go into any other ward in a hospital, you'll see people in their 70s and 80s. And the result of that is that, that uh, in terms of years of working life lost, liver disease is second only to ischemic heart disease in the European region. This is the, the key driver of those changes in liver mortality that we've seen between countries and over time. Uh, and this is the relationship with population level alcohol consumption. You can see on the left hand side, these are countries with a very tight relationship between liver mortality uh, and alcohol consumption. And then there are countries in which you have more liver mortality than you would expect from alcohol consumption on the right hand side. In some cases, this is because of uh, a lot of consumption of unrecorded alcohol. Uh, and in some countries it's due to other causes, for example, viral hepatitis. I think this is a more interesting figure because this is the association of liver death rates with the cost of alcohol, the standardized cost of alcohol. And what this reflects is the exponential relationship between drinking alcohol and mortality from alcohol. 
uh, uh, people dying of liver disease by and large are very heavy drinkers. Uh, the average consumption in the UK of a patient with alcohol-related cirrhosis is four bottles of vodka a week. And what you see here is that countries where alcohol is very cheap are countries with a very high level of liver mortality. In fact, it's almost impossible to have a high level of liver mortality unless you have cheap alcohol. And those countries there on the left-hand side with cheap alcohol, uh, Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, Slovenia, Lithuania, uh, this is the, the, the cheap alcohol is driving this uh, excess liver mortality and this is this is the solution this is this is how we we combat this problem and how we reduce the differential in death rates uh, across Europe this is just an example in the UK of the relationship between liver deaths and alcohol and affordability uh, this is since 1980 and look at the R value it's basically one there's a direct correlation between the price of alcohol, the affordability of alcohol and alcohol deaths. And the other key thing to look at is the elasticity, which is three. In other words, there's a 3% change in liver mortality for a 1% change in affordability. It's very, very easy to drive these changes in liver mortality if we want to. And this is my final slide, and it's pointing out that the things we're doing in liver disease these days are the most costly and the least effective. Treating people in hospital costs a lot of money and survival rates for liver disease, for alcohol-related liver disease anyway, have not improved uh, over the last 20 years. The most effective and cost-effective way to reduce alcohol-related liver harm is to increase the price of alcohol through taxation or a minimum unit price, or both. And this policy has been evaluated by Public Health England in the UK, by the European Court of Justice in the EU, by the UK Supreme Court, and has been backed up by the findings of the OECD modelling uh, that we've published in this commission report. And I'll hand back to you, Patricia. Thank you, thank you, Nick. And uh, uh, there is uh, your knowledge, uh, science, and passion in this topic. And uh, also on behalf of Michael and Tom, I would like to thank you very much for your contribution to the commission. I leave the word now to, to Thomas. Yeah, thanks. Thanks also, Nick, uh, for this um, very yeah, revealing um, slides and, and studies you have done. And, published in, in this commission. So the next speaker will be Professor Shira Selbasagi. She is head of School of Public Health, University of Haifa, and she's also a commissioner and co-author of the Easel Lancet Commission paper, but also a member of the UEG's Public Affairs Committee and Easel's Policy and Public Health Committee. And Shira will talk about children and the power of digital marketing. Please over to you, Shira. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to discuss the topic of children and uh, the power of digital marketing in, in marketing, unfortunately, unhealthy foods to children. This is an important part of the efforts of uh, prevention of liver disease starting from childhood. So this talk will focus on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is in fact the most prevalent liver disease globally and also in Europe. In fact, about a quarter of the adult population have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And if we look at children and children who suffer from obesity, about 30% of them, one third of them have fatty liver. So this is a very prevalent disease and importantly, this disease is oriented by lifestyle, meaning it is strongly associated with lifestyle. And more importantly, it is preventable by lifestyle. And in fact, we have a lot of research and we know what we need to do. We know that we should eat unprocessed foods, low in sugar and fat, similar to the Mediterranean diet pattern. And we know what we don't need to eat. We know that we don't need to eat processed food, processed meat, uh, sugar beverages, but what happens in practice is very different. Why does it happen? It happens because children are exposed to toxic environment and to a environment with many temptations around them. 
So this poses a great challenge to actually uh, practice uh, or implement healthy lifestyle. More importantly, children are regularly exposed to digital marketing of unhealthy foods and drinks rich in sugar and saturated fat and salt. And, and this uh, advertising actually works because studies shows that advertising is a cue to consume unhealthy foods among children. So it's not surprising that children among across Europe and globally are the greatest consumers of ultra processed foods. In fact, more than 50% of the daily calories of children come from ultra processed food. Therefore, this commission actually called for a complete ban on marketing of alcohol and unhealthy foods towards ch uh, children in all social and digital media. And indeed, children uh, drink too much sugar and eat too much sugar. This is a survey that conducted across Europe in the years 2017 and 2018. And we can see the children over consume sugar, beverages and foods. And unfortunately, less than 50% of the children actually eat fruits or vegetables on a daily basis. There is also an issue of inequities. Boys and girls from low affluence families eat more sweets and soft drinks and eat less fruits and vegetables and suffer more from obesity. And this inequity in childhood continues in adulthood. We can see that obesity and type 2 diabetes rates are higher among adults from lower socioeconomic status. So inequity continues for the entire life. And this is in fact the reason that this commission calls to minimize social inequities by subsidizing healthy foods like fruits and vegetables and unprocessed foods and prioritize public health intervention, targeting vulnerable groups, especially children and less affluent part of the, of the population. And we cannot discuss un unhealthy nutrition or ultra processed food uh, rich diet without mentioning specifically the issue of sugar because sugar uh, uh, and especially sugar containing beverages have direct impact on liver health. They cause fatty liver and they also cause a greater liver damage. In fact, infants drinking at least two soft drinks per day, including fruit juice, have three times increased risk to develop Nuffield at the age of 10 years old. Moreover, children who have high sugar consumption have 50% greater risk of having advanced liver disease at childhood. And finally, we know that children who increase their weight during the school age years are more likely to develop fatty liver when they become adults. So that means that prevention with healthy nutrition should start from very, very young age. And finally, I want to uh, end my talk with an optimistic uh, message. There are things that we can do to make the healthier choices the easier choices, and policy measures can have a significant impact. In fact, this is an OECD modeling which shows that the most effective policy measure to improve population health is food reformulation, improving the quality of the food by the food industry, which in fact, if we reduce the amount of calories coming from unhealthy foods high in, in saturated fat and sugar, then we can save life. We can save hundreds of thousands of life years, disability uh, years, and we can also save a lot of money. The combination of food reformulation and food labeling can save billions of euros per year if it, if it would be adopted um, uh, by most uh, countries in Europe. So with this optimistic message, I hope that this commission will have the impact that we expect and I look forward for the next step. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Selva Sagi and Bia Shira. And well, it's so important to start early in life. And I recall during the last ILC, there was even a, a poster showing or an abstract showing that it depends on the obesity of the mother if she's pregnant. And this has an influence also on what's happening later in life. So over to you again, Patricia. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Again, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Patricia Carrieri. Uh, she was one of the uh, Isolancet uh, commissioners. 
and uh, she works in France and uh, particularly dedicated to the inequities and stigma. And in fact, she will give uh, uh, her vision about the stigma as a barrier in pathways of liver care. Patricia. Good afternoon. Uh, today I'm speaking on behalf of the stigma group of this Isolance and Liver Commission, and I will present some key points about how stigma can affect prevention and care for people who are at risk of or living with liver disease. As mentioned, uh, this Liver Commission represents an unprecedented opportunity to explore why the liver disease epidemic is growing, why associated comorbidities are increasing, and why this mainly happens in socially deprived communities. So our research agenda had two main questions. First, how and where to act to reduce the future burden of liver disease? Secondly, uh, who are the communities that need to be targeted and how? So uh, we know that people at risk of liver disease include people with obesity, people with an alcohol use, migrant, people who inject drugs, uh, manual sex with men, people uh, who have history of incarceration. All these populations share uh, social vulnerability, but also the effects of stigma and discrimination. Uh, stigma is generated by stereotypes, which are a way of attributing to these groups the responsibility of having liver disease because of their behavior. They are also a way of denying that policies, the environment, and the organization of the health system are the true drivers of poor liver health. But why stigma is stigma so important? Because there is a vicious circle between stigma, health, and social inequities. Let's see how stigma, uh, let's see where and how stigma occurs. Uh, multiple sources of stigma affect people at risk of liver disease, not only at the population and policy levels, but also in the health setting level. At the policy level, it may manifest in the nomenclature use or guidelines or laws which do not facilitate access to care for specific groups. In the health setting, it may manifest in more subtle ways, uses stigmatizing language, making people wait longer, delegating care to a less experienced colleague, for example. Stigmatizing and discriminatory attitudes result in social distance and generate uh, a condition which is called self-stigma, uh, which results in self-blaming and isolation. This ultimately leads to care avoidance, uh, risk behaviors, and liver disease progression. Consequently, uh, we observe uh, the proportion, an increasing proportion of people with severe diseases and this happens mainly in, again, in, in um, underserved communities. And uh, uh, what happens? Uh, we also have, uh, these communities also have, uh, because of their bad liver health, fewer opportunities of income generating activities. So the final result is increase in social uh, inequity. To reduce stigma in people with liver disease, we need to simultaneously act or knowledge sources using evidence-based interventions. We also need to reduce self-stigma, which is a major arm in this population. Peers, uh, that is to say members of the community of people with liver disease or close to this population, can play a key role to fight against stigma and care avoidance. And this has already been demonstrated in uh, many hepatitis C models of prevention and care. As a stigma is a key driver of the liver disease epidemic, we recommend a range of initiatives to oppose all forms of stigma and discrimination against this population. This initiative can, can involve and must involve peers and could, can combine also several actions. Examples of these actions include treatment patient education programs, they can help reducing self-stigma, increase empowerment, and facilitate engagement in care. The implementation of gender-tailored approaches as women are highly concerned by stigma, and uh, this is uh, something we need to, to take into account 
together with the strategies targeting children and age population. Introduce also evidence-based anti-stigma training programs for our staff in order to reduce uh, stigmatizing discriminatory attitudes in our setting. Finally, as language matters, changing the WHO ICD-12 liver disease coding by removing stigmatizing terms such as alcoholic is also a necessary action. To conclude, to reduce the burden of liver disease, the first and perhaps most important anti-stigma intervention would be to redesign our models of prevention and care with the community of people who have lived with liver disease and not simply for them. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Patrizia. Uh, uh, also that uh, you, you realize that this topic is also so important and uh, we definitely need as a community of hepatologists to support uh, these new initiatives uh, and definitely uh, go ahead with the necessary so far solutions uh, of those problems about uh, stigma and inequities. So thank you Patricia also uh, for your contribution to the commission was very valuable and uh, over to you Tom again. Yes, thank you again. So now we move forward to, to primary care in hepatology and it's my pleasure to introduce Rachel Pryke. Um, Rachel Pryke is a part-time GP partner and trainer in Redditch in Worcestershire with particular interest in obesity, malnutrition, and women's health. Um, she is a member of the Lancet Standing Commission on Liver Disease in UK and was also a member of the NICE Nefford Guideline Development Group and Quality Standard Group. So please, over to you, Rachel. Well, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure to work alongside uh, so many colleagues on this project. And also I'd like to send my thanks to the colleagues and contributors uh, to the primary care uh, working group. Um, I think it's worth saying, I'm a practicing GP. I think it's worth starting by setting the scene of how does liver disease actually appear to non-hepatologists. And this is just a, a quick summary uh, graph just to indicate uh, what the predominant workload is in primary care. It's cardiovascular disease, it's, it's cancer, it's respiratory, it's diabetes. And liver disease is there, but it's a relatively small proportion. And it would be an absurdity to imagine that this commission is asking one disease to compete with other diseases. We're not asking that. And we don't need to, indeed. There, because we have um, shared risk factors for liver disease and other particular metabolic disorders, particularly diabetes and cardiovascular disease, we actually see that there are some real opportunities for, um, for, for, for pitching, for... for um, setting sort of positioning liver disease amongst the metabolic baskets of, of comorbidities that we are already dealing with. Um, and if we achieve that, then we actually can see not only would a focus, strong focus on liver disease actually benefit other comorbidities by addressing risk factors more specifically, but we also can see efficiencies from reducing perhaps the current chaotic and rather unfocused repeat testing uh, that we see and the inappropriate referrals. We're, we're currently unsure who uh, from primary care we should be referring to our hepatology colleagues um, and who we can continue to manage ourselves. So there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, but there is a lot of potential efficiencies that could be had by improving the focus. So when we have a think about what the, what the specifics are, let's understand, well, we are already doing an awful lot of liver blood test testing in primary care. What we don't necessarily feel so confident about is what do those liver blood tests actually mean? How do we understand about that fibrosis pathway that, that Nick outlined? Um, well, actually, uh, GPs really don't have very much understanding of that. So, uh, but, so we, we did a survey uh, in our group. We, we asked uh, uh, GP uh, organizations across Europe about what was the sort of standard of liver care and engagement at the moment. And we found that for a start, we don't even have consistency of what liver blood tests actually mean. So by saying do the do, you know, tests for the liver, we don't even have clarity on that yet. Some countries that will mean do you'll get a whole set of results back. Other countries, you might get a small narrow set of results. And in, in other countries still, you have to ask for each individual component. So 
So there is uh, inconsistencies there, and that that is uh, an issue when we come to giving clear messages about what uh, you know what what we're recommending health professionals to do. We also found that there was not only inconsistent but largely absent incentivization mechanisms to encourage GPs to to be involved in liver disease. What we did find is that there are there have been lots of, of examples in certain countries of isolated uh, you know, mechanisms, particularly for hepatitis C in some areas, but also we've written in the report about some very good examples of effective and efficient practice in terms of um, fibrosis pathways that have been rolled out. What we don't see is any national push to, to standardise that or to, to say to make that feasible. So uh, amongst primary care colleagues, what we see is very low confidence regarding uh, understanding the relevance of liver blood test abnormalities, um, a, a, a lack of understanding about those algorithm pathways, you know, what, how do we make sense, who, who do we need to refer. So these are areas where we know that change is going to need specific uh, action. So in terms of that action, we really need leadership from the hepatology community as a starting point. I, I, I look to uh, Easel, I hope, to, 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 uh, to, to work out how can we standardise what a liver blood test panel actually includes. That would be a, a really good starting point to get some uniformity. We have looked in the Commission and come to a conclusion about a pragmatic first line fibrosis algorithm. We recommend the FIB4 pathway because of its pragmatic nature. Uh, so having a single call for a, a feasible test that could be done anywhere across Europe without special testing required would, would be a very good starting point. And we also need to see much broader broadcasting of, of those referral pathways, the fibrosis pathways, uh, for, for that to be set, sort of established much more widely. And we have seen isolated examples in localities, but nothing sort of nationally driven. But in order for that, we then need to engage our uh, chemical pathology colleagues, um, because uh, changing uh, the, the liver blood test panel requires the involvement of others. So we need to sell our message of the importance of this not only to to our pathology labs but also to service commissioners who uh, need to understand about the the benefits those win-win benefits from that focus on liver disease across a much broader uh, sort of uh, arena than just liver disease itself so we need to have a uh, discussion about how fun, uh, fibrosis pathways might be funded for example hopefully this will then translate to impact in primary care by improving education once we have feasible and funded testing options we have those clear pathways that we can then teach gps to to to, to start using but above all we want to embed liver disease within that multi-morbidity model of patient-centered care if we have a patient who has liver disease the chances are they will have several comorbidities the shared risk factors that underpin much of the alcohol and obesity related liver disease mean that they are going to be at risk of other comorbidities and we need that liver disease to be firmly implanted within that multi-morbidity basket so that uh, care is efficient both from the health professional perspective but also from that patient journey too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rachel, and thank you really very much. And I think the role of primary care and hepatology can't really be overestimated. And this is certainly something uh, Edel and the Commission will have to work on as part of the afterlife of this Commission. So, hand over to you, Patricia. Yes, thank you. So, it's my pleasure to introduce now Pere Dines. Uh, Pere is uh, one of the leaders. In, in the field of hepatology in Europe internationally, we all know him, and uh, he's from Barcelona, and he was one of the commissioners, and he talked uh, to us about the paradigm shift in hepatology. Barry. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this introduction. So my task today is to discuss uh, one of the main um, messages of this uh, Lancet Commission, which is that we need to have a paradigm shift in hepatology from late to early diagnosis of liver cirrhosis. So I will provide you with a rationale for this uh, paradigm shift. So uh, as it has been alluded to, liver cirrhosis is very common and one of the main causes of death and disability adjusted years 
worldwide. The development of cirrhosis takes many years, but the diagnosis is usually made at later stages that have high mortality. So then a paradigm shift is mo mostly needed to diagnose the disease early when treatment and reversibility is still possible. So th this is a schematic representation of the natural history of the development of cirrhosis. You see here a healthy liver, and when there is some factor that causes inflammation of the liver, like obesity, diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, infection due to hepatitis viruses or alcohol risk consumption. So there is deposition of fat in the liver and then there is liver inflammation. So if these uh, factors persist, in some patients there is a progression to a more market inflammation and development of scars in the liver. And this may lead to the development of liver cirrhosis. So then, after the patient has developed liver cirrhosis, the disease progresses and patients develop complications of the disease that have a high morbidity and mortality, and may, they may also develop liver cancer. So this natural history has two characteristics. First of all, it occurs during a very long period of time, an average of 20 or 25 years. And second, it is very silent. So patients do not have symptoms. So unless we have some methods to diagnose the disease in these stages, the patients will go on to the development of cirrhosis. So what the Lancet Commission proposes is to use non-invasive tests of fibrosis for early diagnosis. And these should be done in primary care, but primary care physician and nurses. So that the early diagnosis of chronic liver diseases will be possible, and then application of therapies would lead to the possibility of reversibility of the disease. And this natural history is reminiscent to what occurs in colorectal cancer, although the two diseases are markedly different. So patients have a, mark, a normal colon and they may go into developing small polyps, which are adenomas, which are preneoplastic lesions. After some years, these adenomas may develop into intermediate uh, adenomas and late adenomas that have high probability of development of colorectal cancer. And this takes many years, an average or 10, of 10 or 15 years until cancer is developed. So the strategy in cancer is to try to diagnose the disease in early stages in the face of adenoma, which is very similar to, to what we are proposing for the screening and the uh, early diagnosis of cirrhosis. So if we compare the situation of the paradigm for colorectal cancer and liver cirrhosis, we know that both diseases have very high mortality. In fact, liver cirrhosis has a mortality similar to many of some advanced cancers. Early diagnosis nowadays is common in colorectal cancer, but still it is uncommon in chronic liver diseases. So are there tools for diagnosis? Yes, there are in colorectal cancer, as we showed before. So colonoscopy is a, a very good tool and they are accurate. What about liver cirrhosis? Well, there are some, but accuracy needs to be improved. So how about the screening strategies for the two diseases? So for colorectal cancer, the screening strategies are defined and have been implemented in many countries. For chronic liver diseases, the strategies have not yet been defined completely and they are under evaluation. Does these screening strategies decrease mortality? Yes, in colorectal cancer, likely, but not completely investigated in chronic liver diseases. Are they cost-effective? Yes, in colorectal cancer, likely, but still to be investigated in liver cirrhosis. So the Commission uh, suggests a paradigm shift in the diagnosis of 
uh, chronic liver disease to prevent the development of cirrhosis and prevent the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. So we need to change our current orientation of diagnosis and treatment, which is just management of the complications with a late diagnosis, to a future orientation based on prevention, screening, early diagnosis, and early therapy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Perry. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, over to you, Thomas, again. Yeah, well, now it's, it's really my pleasure to introduce the panel discussion and the chair of the panel discussions. Um, and I would like to start with uh, Maria Buti. Um, she's the director of hepatology and internal medicine at the Hospital Universitario Valdebron in Barcelona in Spain and the EASL EU um, Public Health and Policy Councillor. So I would like to leave it up to you to introduce as a panel. Please, Maria, over to you. Uh, thank you, Thomas. I would like also to introduce my co-chair in this panel discussion, that is uh, Jeff Lazarus. Jeff Lazarus is a member of the Commission of Public Health and he's working in ES Global here in, in Barcelona. And the panelists of this, uh, of, of this session are Professor Slomo Binker. He's full professor in family medicine at the Faculty of Medicine, uh, Tel Aviv, and the president elect of the World Organization of Family Doctors. Welcome, Slomo. Also, Welcome. I would like to introduce um, Michael, Michael Sekini. He is professor in applied uh, health economics at the School of Public Health at the University of Siena. And he uh, and also uh, part for the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development Program of Work on Public Health. And finally, uh, welcome, sorry, uh, Michael. And finally, uh, Rachel Halpo. Uh, Rachel is the European representative of the World Hepatitis Alliance World and, and also CEO of the Hepatitis C Trust in, in the UK. So I think one of the important message of this uh, commission is to shift uh, our attention from patients with advanced uh, liver disease to early diagnosis and prevention. And my first question is for Professor Binker, and it's regarding in, in practice in Europe, what should be the starting point for the implementation of homogeneous clinical care pathways at the primary care level to improve the uh, diagnosis of the most common and also uh, rare liver disease and, 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 and ensure, as, as we have uh, said before, high quality uh, care in all countries. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just one correction. I am the president of Wonka Europe, not Wonka World, but it is a great honor anyway. So it's a great honor to sit here with you today among uh, my distinguished colleagues. And I'm representing more than 100,000 family doctors and general practitioners from all around Europe, members of our organization, and 51 member organizations from 46 countries. Family doctors have an important and critical role in the management of common diseases in general, especially in, in the early stages, in detection and diagnosis, and in active treatment and follow-up later in advanced stages with the specialist. As the population is getting older with multimorbidity and polypharmacy, recognition of liver diseases is even more important due to drug disease interactions and disease disease interactions. Family doctor is the contact point of the patient with the healthcare system from the beginning, which means we as family doctors have the responsibility for health literacy, for the prevention, and most important, for the early detection. If we are moving for early diagnosis, this is the key role of family doctors. 
And in the case of liver diseases, it is even more important to have a high level of suspicion of diagnosis. As we learned, hepatitis C can be cured. Hepatitis B can be controlled and prevent spread to other family members, etc. And treatment regimes, for example, in hepatitis C are now so simple that uh, with the short training and adequate training, the option for family doctors to treat hepatitis C by themselves is easier and leave us a, a further, faster towards eradication. And finally, about the issue of rare liver diseases. Uh, this is a little bit tricky. You know, I'm a, an active family physician and I can say that most of those diseases I will not see even once during my entire professional career. So the trick, I think, the most important thing is to raise awareness. Raise awareness for rare diseases with simple clues that should raise the suspicion and lead to early referral. So it is two different pathways. The common diseases like non-fatty alcoholic liver disease and uh, the rare diseases. But both, uh, I think that there is a key and important role for family doctors all around Europe. Thank you. Thank you for showing the importance of uh, primary care physician. Uh, Jeff, over to you. Thank you, Maria, and thank you really to all the panelists for, for joining us for this important launch event. From the liver field, we're convinced about how important the liver is and, and how concerning liver diseases are. But I'm wondering, Dr. Vinker, I mean, primary care physicians who are so essential to our health systems are also so busy. So, I mean, how do we motivate them? You mentioned raising awareness, but how do we really motivate primary care physicians to better address um, liver diseases? Because even in some of the common liver diseases, fatty liver disease, and to some extent, um, biohepatitis B and C, um, aren't really addressed, I think we could say generally by, by primary care physicians. What would you suggest we do to um, engage them in this? Well, first of all, as you mentioned, hepatitis C, when we have an effective uh, diagnosis, management, and cure. This is the way to, uh, to uh, introduce and to increase motivation. Because, for example, non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease, we know the causes, we know how it is difficult to change lifestyle and to change the physical activity, etc., to uh, compete, with, uh, to fight against obesity. So it is very important to involve family doctors or, or, during all this process from the beginning, you have to bring, to give us tools how to compete with life changes, which is very difficult. You, you need extra time, you need extra skills. And it, these skills should start from medical school, but later on during our training program. And of course, uh, in the way of reimbursement, you know, uh, the problem now with family doctors all over Europe is the that your income depends on the number of patients you see. And to, to change life, lifestyle, to, to, uh, to uh, cope with alcoholism, it's procedures that takes time. And we need time in, in order to increase our motivation. Thank you, Dr. Vinker. I think, I think we all need <laughs> time. But um, I'm wondering, and just very briefly before we move to, to, the, to the next panelist, um, do you think we can get a European-wide approach to addressing liver disease in primary care? Because my understanding is most liver diseases really aren't addressed um, in, in sort of the primary care guidelines and, and trainings. Do you think that's possible, something we can aspire to in Europe? Yes, I think that this is one of the reasons that you invited me and I decided to come to this panel because I see the importance of liver diseases. And, you know, I agree that this is a paradigm shift. You know, malignancy, uh, is, uh, congestive heart failure, uh, everybody understands that they are little. But liver disease, and you know, when I was a medical student, uh, you say, okay, fatty liver is something that you see in ultrasound and nothing else. But now we know that this disease is lethal. So it is important to introduce to everybody the importance of those diseases. And then I believe the family doctors will join uh, this uh, joint uh, fight against liver diseases, especially in the early stages. 
Thank you very much. And, and we will count on, on this partnership with, um, with primary care. Um, Michele Cicchini, you know, we heard from Dr. Vinker about, you know, we need more time. We might even need more training to address unhealthy diets, physical inactivity and obesity, you know, what we call really the, the sedentary lifestyle that, that we're suffering from. And that I think particularly affects um, the liver, not least in, in fatty liver disease. Um, what, you know, what would you recommend really at the population level that Europe can do? I mean, we can engage with primary care physicians, but at the higher level, what can we do? You know, as Dr. Horton said, you know, we no country can really address this alone. So if we're going to take a transnational a European approach, what should we do from your perspective? Thank you for the question. First of all, let me say hello to everyone uh, and to add that it's a real pleasure and honor to be here and as OECD to feed the discussion with evidence we produce. Getting to your question, uh, I think that one thing that at the higher level we can do is to try to keep uh, people away from uh, doctors so that uh, uh, doctors uh, uh, can focus uh, only on, uh, on the cases that really need uh, their work. Uh, in this respect, uh, investing on prevention policies, whether on alcohol or obesity, other risk factors for liver diseases, uh, it's really a very effective and efficient way uh, to keep people healthy. Now, if we look at the policies on obesity, uh, during the last decades, countries have achieved a lot uh, uh, in these policies, but there are still uh, many things that can do. And in particular, they should try to address uh, uh, some of the gaps uh, that currently uh, policy landscape has across countries. And in particular, I would like to identify three areas that, uh, in my opinion, are of high uh, priority. The first one is that uh, uh, very often uh, we see that uh, uh, policies uh, are implemented in forms that are not the most effective. Now, referring to the, to the, uh, to the release that we are discussing today, one of the policies that we were discussing is food labeling. If you ask countries in the European region, do you have a policy on food labeling? Most of them will say yes. But uh, when you go into detail, uh, we know that the most effective policy is to have uh, uh, compulsory front of pack labeling that is easy to understand for people uh, so that uh, it can really steer uh, change. Uh, and instead, the type of policies that countries have in place are the most desperate. Second uh, priority. Uh, we need uh, to uh, implement policies uniformly across the country, within the country. Uh, for example, uh, uh, particularly in countries that delegate uh, policies to subnational level, we see a lot of heterogeneity in how policies uh, are implemented even within the same country. The third priority is uh, uh, that we have limited resources uh, or practical problem that uh, in practical terms uh, end up limiting the number of individuals that benefit uh, uh, from the policy. Going back to what uh, the previous panelists said, uh, primary care doctors uh, have a fundamental role, uh, for example, to provide counseling to identify early uh, cases of liver diseases, uh, but uh, they are overwhelmed uh, by so many things to do that uh, government should put in place uh, uh, policies that enable uh, primary care doctors to work on that and also provide the right incentives for primary care doctors to work on that. Let me just add one last thing. Uh, based on the analysis uh, uh, that we carried out, uh, generally speaking, a very good approach is to try to change the environment in which people live to make healthier choice uh, the easier choices. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, very important. Your comments are very, very important. But how to implement in a uniform way across all European countries? And also, mm, I, I think it's very important that people understand all of these uh, policies, because if people don't un understand and we cannot reach to uh, general population, then it's difficult. To, to, to apply all of this? Sure. Uh, well, the very first step, in my view, is to create the political willingness uh, uh, to make it work. Uh, and this can be uh, done uh, uh, through uh, different ways, uh, but I think that uh, we should use a multi-pronged approach uh, uh, because we really need uh, to push it through 
uh, the various levels. Uh, so first one, create political willingness. In my opinion, the priority are to focus uh, attention on the issue. The work that this commission has been doing with liver disease is an excellent example of how we can uh, uh, keep uh, this issue high, uh, both in the political agenda, but also uh, um, high in people's mind. Uh, for example, making sure that the message is spread widely across media. So um, once that uh, the uh, public uh, will is gained, uh, we should also try to use this uh, public will to gain the political will uh, to make the changes uh, in the policy landscape uh, uh, that enable action to take place. Uh, we need to show data, for example, uh, but also uh, try to tie the problem uh, to a relatively uh, obvious uh, and from a political point of view palatable uh, uh, solution. Uh, for example, if we talk about uh, uh, preventing harmful alcohol consumption or uh, uh, talking about promoting healthier diet, uh, uh, focusing uh, uh, primarily on children, which is one also the point that uh, uh, this commission uh, uh, makes, uh, is uh, a way uh, to increase the political willingness. Finally, we also need to find the champions, uh, either countries or persons, Ursula von der Leyen made uh, a, a very interesting speech at the beginning, uh, particularly when it comes to, to cancer treatment and uh, cancer prevention. And uh, to this respect, I think we can consider Ursula von der Leyen a champion uh, in uh, uh, preventing cancer and liver diseases. Second, countries need also to uh, devote resources, um, in some cases additional resources to make policy efforts. Now, in our analysis uh, on the cost effectiveness of these policies, uh, we come to the conclusion that many of the policies that, that we are assessing are ex uh, very cost effective, in some cases, uh, even cost saving. Uh, so uh, down the line, uh, the savings uh, and the increase in labor force productivity, for example, they produce are higher compared to the cost of implementation. But we need to have uh, uh, some investment upfront uh, to, to make it start. Finally, we need to spread uh, best practices across countries. Uh, there are countries that have been testing new policies. Uh, let's think about, uh, for example, minimum unit pricing in Scotland rather than Russia or other countries, countries that have uh, exper uh, experimented food labeling, countries that are investing heavily on, for example, reformulation. Uh, and when we identify one of these best practices, uh, we need to help countries spread the information, spread the voice, but also spread the evidence uh, and help them transfer and implement practices. Just uh, let me give you an example to close. Uh, looking at uh, some of the policies that we are discussing today, there is currently in place uh, a EC funded uh, joint action called Best WIMAP that is uh, led by, uh, that is used by many uh, European countries and they focus on reformulation, marketing, regulation of marketing to children and procurement policies to make sure, for example, that we have nutritious and healthy food in schools uh, all across Europe. These are examples of how we can advance the policy making uh, on this field. Thank you. Before moving to Rachel, uh, a very short comment about industry. Some of these policies are against industry interest. So we need to talk with industry. Just a short comment, please, Michael. It depends a lot from the type of policies we are talking about, uh, but in some cases industry uh, may also be interested uh, in some of these policies because they can uh, identify new market niches uh, um, and just uh, uh, talking about reformulation, I think that industry is uh, very interested, uh, certain part of the industry are very interested uh, in uh, uh, type of incentives and opening of new markets uh, uh, that the investing or reformulation may offer. Thanks a lot. Jeff, over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Michele. It's really great to get your, your insights. I mean, it's, it's difficult in one country to make changes. It's difficult across Europe, but I think um, with allies at the OECD and also with Dr. Vinker at, um, at Wonka, we can start to make some inroads because as we've shown in this commission, um, liver disease is one of the big public health challenges. And, and as was put earlier, a crisis in Europe. Rachel, Halford um, from the World Hepatitis Alliance. It's, it's great to have you um, on this panel. Um, I appreciate the work you've been doing in biohepatitis you know, and collaborating with us for so many years. 
Um, one of the recommendations of the Easel Lancet Liver Health Commission is, is investment to, to scale up case findings and screening for viral hepatitis in selected and, and broader community settings with reflex testing for viremia for those with antibodies. And we were just wondering, you know, how do we move from this recommendation to an action, taking into account all of the challenges and inequities with vulnerable and marginalized populations, many of the groups um, that you're working with in the UK and indeed all across Europe. You might be on mute, Rachel. I am on mute. I apologize. There you are. Good I'm to so hear you. sorry. I think I'm the first person to have done that. I apologize to everybody. No, no, no. There's always one, and we, <laughs> and we needed it. Otherwise, it's not a it's not a good meeting. Well, no, it's me. Sorry, and I, I apologize about that. But I just wanted to say so. Thank you for being um, for uh, inviting me to be here. But and thank you for the uh, presentations earlier on, which have been brilliant. And when we're talking about the crisis with liver disease. Um, and you're, we're talking about viral hepatitis, this is an area where we can actually do something. We can really do something effective and we can do it quite quickly. And I think firstly, it's imp really important to say that if we have this opportunity to eliminate viral hepatitis across Europe, what we do have to do is we do have to scale up and we have to have meaningful accessible testing for all, including um, marginalized and hard to reach groups. Um, in terms of reflex testing, what we, what we really need to do when we are, uh, what we really need to do is to make the pathway shorter. You know, what we know is that um, a lot of the people affected by hepatitis C are people from marginalized, hard to reach um, groups that suffer from huge inequities across health. Um, and what we need is to make that pathway really short. Uh, we need to ensure that there's equity of access um, and uh, meaningful engagement, which is really difficult because I think the thing about reflex testing is, is it's an antibody testing, but it also offers an opportunity for another test to be done on that same sample. When you're testing somebody who has a really chaotic life, they aren't gonna come back for a PCR. They're not gonna come back for another test. So, so the what we really need is to have this shorter, um, be able to get the results straight away. Um, in addition, I think that the arc of uh, acute disease for, for viral hepatitis, hepatitis C and hepatitis B, is so long that people don't actually understand the um, severity and the urgency in the need to be treated. They lose interest so they don't come back. But we are all really acutely aware of the catastrophic consequences of end-stage liver disease to the individual and, to be quite frank, to the public purse. So it's actually senseless when there's a short and easy cure for hepatitis C that we actually don't just do short, immediate testing. I think this is a great opportunity to notice that, um, to note that hepatitis C carries masses of stigma and we heard it in one of the presentations earlier, um, lots of misinformation and such. I think it's really important that the healthcare providers all people delivering tests are really quick to deliver the right messages to keep people engaged. Um, and it really, I mean, I, it's a really uh, effective way to pass on the messages and to change the conversation. Um, Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, I mean, you identified really one of the cornerstones of what we put forward, um, you know, in the commission about simplification. You know, when we ask people, um, you know, uh, at risk of hepatitis C, how often they'd like to come to the hospital, it's not often or, or even not at all. So we need that kind of decentralized services that you and community groups are providing. We need to simplify and reflex testing, which would save the system money, which would save everyone time is still so difficult for so many of our hospitals and clinics, even here in Spain, where it's championed, um, it's not implemented um, in all settings. Let me pass over to you, um, Maria. I know you had a question as well. Yes, Rachel. This commission has worked a lot um, on a stigma. I would like to know your considerations and, and do you think we have to do more at uh, some more important things regarding stigma? And I think uh, your point of view on this will be extremely important. 
absolutely we have to change the we have to change the conversations and we really have to do something about the stigma to liver disease across the board but particularly you know the area i work in is hepatitis c and one really sure effective way of doing this is using peers is using people affected you know the, the to uh, to really be effective and to move forward in terms of reaching everybody affected by hepatitis for example People with lived experience are the are the solution. Working in partnership with other professionals, um, they provide a really effective um, means to a shorter pathway to changing the conversation. For somebody who's um, really hard to engage, who's out there perhaps using drugs on the streets, the one person they will live, listen to is somebody who's got lived experience, somebody who's shared their life experience. So using people with lived experience, using patients, really helps to change the conversation. When somebody with lived experience moves forward and they present and they talk to healthcare professionals, we do a lot of it in the UK, it changes the perception of those affected by the disease and hence changes the stigma. So it's really important that patients are involved and patients are at the center, not only of their care, but also in supporting other people to be kept to and other people towards their own care as well. Thanks so much. Go ahead, Maria. No, no, go ahead, Jeff. Thanks so much, Rachel, Rachel, for raising the issue of stigma. And you've been such a champion in keeping this on the agenda. I think one of the novelties of, of this commission has been the, the attention that's been given to stigma and discrimination, as um, Patricia Carrieri pointed out in, in her um, presentation, and also the different kinds of stigma, you know, the structural stigma, the self-stigma in the health system, outside of the health system, and double, triple, quadruple stigma related to alcohol, having biohepatitis, being a woman, being an injecting drug user, being a migrant. I mean, it's such a minefield and such a challenge. And the health systems really have to um, have to take that on if we're going to address um, li you know, liver um, disease properly. Let me um, thank all three panelists. Thank you so much, Shlomo Vinker, Michele Cecchini, and you, Rachel, for joining us in this session where we you know try to look at how do we move from the recommendations made in this commission to action. So this is really you know just just the start, the beginning discussion. I mean, the the the, um, the commission report has been live only for an hour and a half, and I think it's gonna be relevant for years and years to come. Let me um, hand back to the co-chairs of this launch event, Dr. Thomas Berg, the ESO Secretary General, and Dr. Patricia Burra, the Lancet ESO Commission co-chair. And thank you again for joining us. Yeah, thanks a lot, um, Jeff and, and Maria for this, um, very interesting panel discussion. So we have uh, some question coming from the floor and in order to, to answer them all, I would like to ask for yeah, short answers. And the first question perhaps really goes to Professor Horton and, and the Lancet. So the colleague is asking, do you think it would be useful for the Lancet, but also other medical journals to develop conflict of interest form to prevent alcohol industry funded research? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, well, this issue of competing interests and the role of industry, we've, uh, we have tried to take very seriously through a project that we have launched on the commercial determinants of health. Uh, and I think this is a very under-researched area, actually. Um, Interestingly, we launched a, a piece of work earlier this week on nutrition in adolescence. And one of the areas that we identified through that work is the extraordinary lack of data and lack of research in uh, adolescent nutrition, which of course leaves, the, uh, leaves industry with a wide open goal to try and score some major victories in influencing the uh, choices, the unhealthy choices often of young people in uh, whether it be alcohol or food or, or whatever. Um, so I think, uh, I think there needs to be a, a concerted effort to identify these commercial determinants. We've talked about social determinants, we talk about economic determinants, political determinants of health, but we don't talk enough about commercial determinants. So watch this space. There'll be more to come on that from us in the future. Thanks a lot. 
So there are several questions related to, you know, alcohol pricing, taxes, and so on. So for you, um, Professor Sharon, so the one is, um, do you think that low awareness of alcohol caused harms prevents policymakers from paying enough attention? With the second question, should we focus our effort on, uh, on alcohol health warnings, such as alcohol caused liver disease, on, on alcoholic beverages or some something similar like that? Uh, yes, I think there is a, a very low awareness uh, of liver disease as an issue because as, as Rachel Pryke said, um, it, you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't tend to be visible to people. Um, so I think, I think that is an issue and that is an issue for policymakers. With, with regard to, to health warnings, I mean, it's just crazy, isn't it? There's a, uh, you, you can sell a, a, a carton of orange juice with vodka in it and you don't have to label it in any way because there's a derogation for alcohol from the, from the EU for labelling. But if you sell orange juice on its own, it has to carry a label with its constituents and its nutritional information and all of that. So yes, there's a real deficit uh, in information communication and we need to take a leaf from how we've tackled tobacco because essentially all of the determinants are exactly the same. Yeah, and there's one question even going further in this direction because of all the things alcohol does. So the question is, it's more like a drug. So would it be uh, better to systematically call alcohol a drug instead of blaming people for their consumption? <laughs> well, yeah, I don't well, know, know whether it's taken serious. Al 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 alcohol is a, is a, is a drug. We we did a, a report on training in the in the UK called, called Alcohol and Other Drugs about teaching medical schools uh, medical students about alcohol and other drugs. You know, it's a it's a it's a very potent, uh, very effective, and in uh, and you know and in some ways very toxic drug if it's used in the wrong way. Yes, it's a drug just like all the others. Yeah. And there's one recommendation that a measure as simple as the obligation of all hotel establishment like cafeterias, restaurants, hotels and so on to serve free water to all their customers could contribute to this awareness. Do you think this would help? Yes, I, th I mean, I think that is a requirement in some European countries. And I think the other area that's very interesting in terms of the commercial aspects is the development of alcohol free and low alcohol products which uh, are, are really increasing in market share dramatically. And I think this is something that could have a big, very big impact. And there are win-win uh, scenarios here for the commercial operators and, and for public health. Yeah, thanks a lot. Now, um, over to you, Shira. There are some questions related to the Mediterranean, Mediterranean uh, diet. So the first question is that many people are perhaps not able to afford it. So what practical steps we can take and what advice you can give to these patients? It's, it's amazing that in all the years that I talk about diet and fatty liver disease, there is always this question from the audience. And I, and, and I think it is a really an important question because uh, as I said in my talk, the, the healthy foods are far more expensive than the unhealthy foods. So we, there is a great gap between what we recommend the patients and what they can afford practically. And in fact, it has been shown that food insecurity, uh, yeah, meaning that people can't afford buying healthy food, not just buying food in general, is related with NAFLD and more advanced liver disease. So this is a really important topic. I can only say that we, we, we need to subsidize, this commission recommends to subsidize healthy foods and to put taxation on unhealthy foods like uh, sugar beverages and, may and maybe take the, uh, the tax money and to invest it in, in reduction of prices of healthy foods. So this is one idea. But generally I can tell uh, at the moment that there are things that we can do even without uh, affording uh, very expensive foods. We can reduce, first of all, sugar beverages consumption. So this and, and drink water. So this doesn't cost money. And this is a very important first step. As I said, sugar is very harmful uh, in terms of liver disease. And the secondly, we can try and have more home cooking meals uh, and processed food as much as possible and try to reduce uh, the consumption of ultra processed food. These are very yeah. important 
first two steps and just one physical activity. Yeah, well, in, in, same yeah, in the same direction, the question here is, what can the countries do to control the fast food danger? So I, I think that, uh, first of all, we need to combine all the interventions. There is no one good intervention. So we need education to educate the population, but it's never enough to have education. And education also starts from a very young age, from childhood in school age children. It should be part of their teaching programs. Uh, but beyond that, we need to change the environment and we can change the environment, uh, for example, by food labeling. If, uh, if we use mandatory front of pack food labeling, then the food industry would have uh, the incentive to improve the, the nutrient content of the food. Because if they need to put a red label on the food saying it's high in fat or salt or sugar, then they would try to do food reformulation and to improve the nutritional value of the food. So food labeling goes together with food reformulation, education, of course, taxation on soft drinks, and we need to be very strong about it and very unified. We need a uniform uh, uh, measures uh, all across Europe. Uh, and we need also to work together with, with the food industry, but not to let the food industry lead these measures. It has okay. to be story by policy. Yeah, thank you very much. There are um, some questions related to primary care. So for you, Rachel, uh, so what is the level of primary care transfer um, to specialized care, so to hepatologists. Is there any numbers, percentages? Do we have data on that? Well, I think that's a very changing picture at the moment. I think with the pandemic, we've had a lot of changes in how GPs are interacting with secondary care in general. And we've certainly seen far more models of um, specialists so, uh, being contacted by email and getting much more informal guidance. So I think I think there is a, that's a changing field at the moment. And we've got a lot of opportunity for hepatologists to recognise that a little bit of education for GPs, we, we don't need to know a lot in primary care. What we do need to know is exactly what you want us to do. So we don't need to become specialists. We don't need to become passionate about liver, di liver disease. We actually just need to have a structure and to get on and in incorporate that into the sort of patient care approaches that we are you know, already involved in with the other sort of shared comorbidities, you know, particularly in metabolic diseases. So, so I think it's um, in terms of referrals, what we actually need are, are, are simple structures and in a way um, guidance as to when, a, when referral is needed, who do we actually need to follow up? Well, it's those who are developing fibrosis. So that's a key message for hepatologists to inform GPs about that this is the, this is the important step that we need to gear up to rather than just there are abnormal liver blood tests and you know a lot of the time we don't need to be overly concerned you know we we, we need we, we've got simple processes for that not referral processes. Okay thank you very much so the last question goes to Professor Dunes and it's also a bit related to primary care so how to target who should get a test for cirrhosis at an early stage if there are no symptoms? Okay, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, we do not have a, a complete answer to this question, but this would depend on risk factors. So we have to check first for the presence of risk factors uh, of liver disease. So if the patient has risk factors for chronic hepatitis B or C infections, they of course should be uh, um, the, the hepatitis C or B virus markers should be done. And if the patients are at risk for increased alcohol consumption or metabolic disease, then this, it requires a second step. And this second step is uh, something that measures uh, or estimates fibrosis in the liver. So the most accurate is probably uh, elastography. But of course, elastography is not available in primary care, so we should do something else. And that's why the Commission proposes to use some serological factors, particularly FIB4. We know that FIB4 is not the, the best method, but at least it's a method that is uh, widely available and is cheap. Uh, this is going to change in the future, but for the time being, I think that FIB4 is what we should uh, do in these cases. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, before hand over, handing over to, to Patricia, there's a comment, should EASL develop a European code against liver diseases? 
similar to the one developed for cancer. Of course, we will give it a thought and hand over to you, Patricia. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. So it's, it's a pleasure to introduce now Sabine Kleiner. You already heard from Richard Orton that is responsible uh, for the Lancet office in Munich. Uh, may I say that she was really a key person uh, in the development of the activity in the working uh, of the commission. And uh, may I say that her contribution was really of great value for all of us. And she followed all the, the activity of the nine working group and uh, 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 in particular all the meetings uh, we three of us as chairs. So Sabine, thank you very much. Up to you to talk to us about the future opportunities of the Lancet Commission. Sabine. Thank you very much, Patricia, and it's uh, great to see that coming to fruition now. This is always a really, really great moment um, when one sees a commission finally published after a really intensive three years of work. And we have just now heard about the main findings and recommendations advocating a really fundamental shift towards prevention and early diagnosis. And we have started a discussion on how to take these recommendations forward. The word afterlife has already been mentioned multiple times, which is great to hear. And Richard has already alluded to that, but we see our commissions at The Lancet as a way to combine academic excellence with our activist spirit. And so, as such, we really regard the publication of a commission as a beginning. So you might ask what comes next? So thinking about the future opportunities for a commission, I think these will come at different stages from immediately after the publication to a more medium term or longer term strategy. So in the immediate um, after phase, I would say it's really important to think about dissemination as widely as possible. And we have already had preliminary discussions among the commissioners on this, and we'll try and convene once more before Christmas. But please contact us if you see any opportunities here, for example, in scientific meetings or other gatherings in the next six months or so. In the more medium term, it would be great to create a broad partnership, perhaps with Easel in the driving seat, but also with other relevant entities to make a concrete plan on how to take the recommendations forward and measure and monitor their progress. I'll give you a couple of examples of what has happened in this area with some of our previous commissions. So following the publication of the University College London Lancet Commission on Migration in December 2018, Lancet Migration was launched as an independent body funded by research funding organizations and institutions and with administrative support based at UCL with the aim to make a positive impact on the lives of people who migrate and to the environment in which they live through multidisciplinary research, leadership, engagement, dissemination of research and last but not least, strong advocacy. A second example, following the 2015 Lancet Commission on Climate Change, the Lancet Countdown Tracking Progress on Health and Climate Change was formed in 2016 and started with a public consultation to identify key areas of climate change to track and monitor. And since then, each year, 120 leading experts from academic institutions and UN agencies work together on these and publish an annual report of their findings with us ahead of the UN climate change ne ne negotiations, as just happened for Glasgow. Similar similarly, Richard has already mentioned the Lancet Commission on Liver Diseases in the UK, and that commission has published annual updates on progress since its first publication in 2014 in the form of a standing commission. A standing commission for us is an ongoing engagement and publication plan with, with the Lancet. So for the Lancet Easel Liver Commission, it'd be great to find a way to create a post-publication life or even an entity within Europe and with European partners and funding in a similar way. We at The Lancet would certainly be delighted to see this happen and be partners in such a plan. And we would look very much forward to all the next steps to make the liver a window to the health of all Europeans. So to conclude, I want to thank all the commission chairs, 
all the commissioners for a really great co collaboration. And thank you to Easel for being a partner in this and for organizing this launch. Thank you also to our panelists and thank you also to all listeners and participants in this launch event. Thank you, Sabine. We are thanking you and the message is clear. We would like to maintain this uh, strong partnership, but surely with further developments in the, in, in the very future. So thank you again. Thank you, Sabine. Thomas? Yeah, well, um, Patricia, we are coming to the end of this really fantastic webinar. And well, now it's my pleasure to come to the closing remarks. And here I would like to introduce really one of the person who was really initiating the whole process. And this is Professor Tom Hemming Carlson. And he is research head at the Clinic of Surgery, Inflammatory Disease and Transplantation of the University of Oslo. And as I mentioned, a very important co-chair of the Easel Lancet Commission. So please over to you, Tom, for the closing remarks. And thanks a lot for all your efforts. Thank you very much, Thomas, uh, dear audience, dear uh, faculty. It's been a wonderful uh, journey uh, going through this uh, launching event. Clearly so much work has been done and it's actually the time for thanking people. I know that you're all eager to log off and start reading the paper, but I want to show you two slides. The first slide is uh, uh, showing us that this is not the first step of a journey. This is a journey which was started some time ago by Roger Williams. I'd love to have him here, as many have already mentioned. Um, he uh, drove the six uh, Lancet papers coming from the UK Commission. And actually the background of this commission was uh, from Phil Newsom, uh, at that point, Vice Secretary of ESOL. And he thought, why don't we do this at the European level? And uh, this is actually matching the ESO uh, policy developments over the recent years. Uh, there has been a journey going back, starting with the HEPA map uh, roadmap, going through the HEPA health project. And uh, in many ways, uh, this commission and the, the, um, the, the combination of expertise and uh, uh, perspectives going into it is actually a synthesis of what has been going on for several years in the UK Commission, for several years in ESOL. And I would like to thank very much uh, the Lancet for giving us this opportunity for this partnership. Thank you very much, Sabina, for your guidance. It's been absolutely invaluable to Richard for allowing us to do it and to ESOL for supporting the project all the way until this uh, launching event, which has been a wonderful experience. And I think uh, what's only left for me to say is uh, 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 thank also to all the attendants having stayed with us during these almost two hours uh, in the middle of the best working hours. Uh, now we will leave you to read the report. And I think that the, the main uh, last point I'd really like to make of this meeting don't just read it, act upon it. This is not uh, a conclusion, it's a starting point. And I know that ESOL is committed to taking the word work onwards. We are committed uh, and the uh, uh, community is committed. So uh, uh, I look forward to watching the next steps and to contribute uh, where I'm needed. So thanks to everybody, have a good day uh, and uh, thanks for joining us.